the Second Continental Congress and George Washington, for political reasons, say, we need to bring this guy in close. We need to make him very happy. We need to give him what he wants. And in so doing, he can have a little adventure. He can run around. He can get shot at. He can go home. He can show his war wounds off to uh, the women in Versailles and then convince the French to give us a bunch of money, which that was what the plan was. And it just so happened that Lafayette himself was an endearing enough person and well-liked enough just as an individual. He was not imperious. He was not arrogant. Him and George Washington, after just a few weeks, really hit it off. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Oh man, fun one today. Um, well, is it weird to start your podcast by saying a fun one today? The implication being the other ones aren't fun. But you know, sometimes we do very heavy topics. Sometimes we do lighter ones. And sometimes we do ones that just, they're, they're not drenched in pathos. And I, I would describe today as a not drenched in pathos, a fascinating and important tale And it's a historical tale today, and I think the place I want to start is just by saying it is an unbelievable cliche, particularly I think about like middle-aged and older dads. I think it's very gendered for some reason, and I think it's weird that it is, like become real history buffs. I remember a a tweet saying like, every dad has to choose between being a Civil War dad and a World War II dad, and you only get to be one, (laughs) which made me really laugh, uh, which I keep thinking of. I'm actually neither. I'm a Reconstruction dad. That's my thing. But- I've always loved history. I loved history when I was a student in high school. I didn't pursue it that much in college. And I think, you know, there's there's a there's ways in which I think history can be branded or perceived as being musty and old or boring or dense. And there's lots of historical writing that is all of those things. But, you know, ultimately, all history is is anything any human or human society or institution did in the past, which is basically all of human life on the planet. (laughs) So there's lots of fascinating stuff, no matter what you're into, in quote-unquote history. And one of the great things that I've discovered over the last few years has been a great source of both joy and enlightenment for me are history podcasts. It's a whole universe. And let me tell you, like, they're a game changer on a long drive. If you're a long drive by yourself, if you are going for long walks, if, I mean... They are great, and there's a bunch of them out there. The one that I first discovered is a podcast called Revolutions, and it's a podcast that is all about, as you might intuit, various revolutions. I have learned so much from this podcast, I cannot even begin to tell you. I I feel like I've learned more from this podcast about the stuff that I've listened to than all of my education combined. There's an incredible season on the Haitian Revolution, which I have to say I knew essentially nothing about. There is the French Revolution, the the revolution of all revolutions in terms of how I think certain people think about it. There is the Glorious Revolution in England, which is not quite a revolution, but it's kind of a revolution. And then right now, or there's for a long time, a series on the Russian Revolution, which to me has been one of the best. The guy who hosts this, a guy by the name of Mike Duncan. And when I first encountered it, you know, one of the great things about like the internet when the internet is being good is just discovering corners of talent and ability that are coming through the internet that wouldn't necessarily have been brought to you by other channels. That to me is the great thing about the internet. Like when you see a TikTok video, it's got 20 million views and it is so funny and so sharp and it's some random teenager who's got like an incredible sense of timing and wit or whatever. And in the previous methods of conveying that probably wouldn't have let that teenager express that to you. But thanks to the internet, you're seeing it. And that's when I sort of love the internet. There's a lot of bad internet out there. But Revolutions to me was like the paradigmatic example of the good internet because the guy, I looked him up and I was like, wait, what's this guy's deal? This is so good. Is he a a broadcaster? Is he a professor of history? And it's like, no, I don't know. He's just a really smart, erudite, interesting, curious dude uh, who started doing this. His first uh, podcast was uh, about Rome. He then wrote a book about that. Then he started the Revolutions podcast. And now he has a second book out, which I have to say is also extremely, extremely well done. And it's about a figure 
who is prominent in two different revolutions. So it makes a lot of sense for him, given what he's been working on. Um, the Marquis de Lafayette, who is an incredibly important figure in the American Revolution, is a very young man. I mean, starts up 19, teenager when he comes here to fight in George Washington's Continental Army, and then goes back to France, where he is a key figure in the French Revolution, and then makes a triumphant return to the United States in the 1820s. It's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating book, and and is at the intersection of all the the various interests that Mike Duncan has. So, Mike, it's great to have you in the program. It's very nice to be here. Congrats on all your success. I'm a big fan. I've I've been sort of rooting on the success because I've gotten so much from your work. How did you become a history podcaster? Boy, that's a that's a really interesting question because I'm not. I don't quite know how it worked out the way that it did. I just came out of university. I studied political science and philosophy. I'm not I wasn't even technically a history major in college, but I had been doing so much history reading to understand what I was studying. I basically majored in political theory and a lot of like liberal political theory. I'm you know like Scottish Enlightenment guys like Hume and, and Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. But to understand political theory and the theorists that are writing about it, you have to like learn about the history of the time and place that they were living. If you want to understand Machiavelli, you've got to learn about the Italian city states at that time. If you want to understand why Hobbes is talking about how you need a strong central ruler in order to prevent chaos, you have to understand that he was writing in the middle of like a generation long civil war in Britain. And so when I came out of university, I sort of left the theory stuff behind and had just dove headlong into the history side of it. And then in particular, I started with the history of Rome. I fell head over heels in love with the ancient historians like Livy and like Polybius and Plutarch and Cassius Dio. Like, so I'm just devouring all of these books and realizing that most of what I knew about Roman history and most of what I think everybody knows about Roman history is confined to this very narrow band inside the, the very broad spectrum of Roman history, which is like, we know Caesar, you know, we know Augustus and, uh, you know, Caligula and Nero, because there's always going to be some salacious movie about Caligula or Nero. And I was looking around and saying to myself, like, nobody, nobody really knows a lot of what's buried in these ancient histories. And this is 2006 and 2007. And this is what I, we now realize was the early days of podcasting. But there was a whole slew of history podcasts that existed at the time. And I was listening to those. And I went looking for a Roman history podcast to expand my own understanding of Roman history, realized no such thing existed yet. And so I'm looking at all this material. I feel like I'm a pretty good writer. I'm a pretty good communicator. I'll just sit down and start putting these out there. And as you said, like on the internet, there's no, there are no suits that are going to say, no, son, this is not going to work. Nobody's going to buy this. We're not going to approve this. There were no gatekeepers. And there still are a, a nice thing about independent podcasting and the independent internet was there are no gatekeepers. So nobody could tell me I couldn't do it. So I just started putting out episodes one day and every week I would have a few more listeners and a few more listeners. And it just kind of kept growing until the next thing I know, I'm just kind of a professional history podcaster. How old were you at the time? I was 27 when I started. Okay. So you were in your late twenties when you started. Yes. You're kind of doing different. You were a fishmonger at one point. Is that right? Did I read that? Yeah. Correctly? Well, I had to, I had to keep the, I had to keep the day job going yeah, because, right. so, because originally, I mean, there was no, there was no money in podcasting. It was just something I was doing. So yes, by day I was working at a fish market in Portland, Oregon. And then at night and really on my breaks and, you know, on my lunch break and, and after work, I'd be putting together these episodes. And so I lived this like weird double life where the people, believe me, the people that I work with cutting fish were not the people who are listening to a long history of the Roman empire. And I, they would say like, what do you, what do you do at night? That's crazy. You're writing a history of the Roman empire. I'm like, yeah, it's just what I do. Uh, and then the people who know me from the history of Rome would be like, wait, what do you do all day? You just cut fish. I'm like, yeah, I just cut fish. And it was, it was actually really great to have this sort of job that required literally no brain power. Like it's, it's not a job that requires a great deal of thought, which I wanted so that I could save all of sort of like my creative energy for what yeah. I was doing on nights and weekends. And so this, what, what is the method? I mean, this is, I don't know how many people listening to this are interested in this, but I am. So we're just going to go there. Like I am fascinated by a creative process and your podcasts are, they're essentially like red essays. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. it's, you're, you are reading your own historical writing. Mm -hmm. How do you, what's the process? Like, how do you, how did you start putting these together? Yeah. What I, I consider myself first and foremost, a writer. That's what I do. Like 90, 90% of the job is putting together the scripts, writing the scripts. And then, you know, the actual 
podcast itself is just me reading what I have spent all week writing. And so really what it is, I just, at the beginning of like a series of revolutions, let's say, I'll put together like a giant bibliography of things that I need to be reading. And then we'll just sort of devour these all on a first pass. And then as I'm moving through the timeline each week, I'm reading through all of the books that I've already got sort of like prearranged that I'm going to be looking at. And I'll read the sections that are relevant to that week's episode, whether like, you know, when we're in the Russian Revolution, I'm talking about like a six week period in one particular episode. I'm, I'm about to do the Kornilov incident in the Russian Revolution. So this is like a six or eight week period. So I'm reading like a like a dozen or so different books that are each covering this from a different angle. And I'm just taking very, very extensive notes. I take very, very detailed notes from all the books that I'm reading. And then I just will sit down and turn that all those notes into a script. And by this point, I've now been doing this for like, you know, almost 15 years. You know, in the beginning, it was it was quite a bit of work just to crank out, you know, 2000 words. And these days, uh, you know, an episode is 4000 to 4500 words. And that's what I'm writing every week. But I can I I have now a method and a process for, I think, doing this in in an efficient way. 4000 good words, which yours are a week is not nothing. I mean, that's 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 a lift. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, again, it's it's doable, but that's that is that's work. Yeah. And it's and it's something that uh, that it is true. It's work. And then the times that I have also been writing a book at the same time that I'm making episodes. That's, um, yeah, that's too much. Yeah, for me. it's well, it's it, it was too much for me, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it all it all turned out OK. Um, but yeah, those it's a lot. But that's what I do. I'm I, I think even uh, before I'm even, uh, you know, a, a writer in terms of like having it be my career or my profession, like it's just what I constitutionally am. I want to read books and I want to write things. That's just sort of how I've always done my life going back to childhood. When you say you became a professional podcaster, like, again, this is a little bit like industry talk, but was there a point at which on the, on the Rome, like, how were you, were you selling ads against the Rome stuff? Was that, at what point were you able to do this as your job? Officially, I became a professional, full-time professional podcaster when I started Revolutions. That was sort of the the moment when I did it. During the history of Rome, like I think the first couple of years of history of Rome, I was just doing it to do it. And then uh, uh, the company that I host the ads, or excuse me, the company I host with it, which is Libsyn, um, uh, Audible got in touch and said, hey, we're now ad- advertising on, um, uh, we're now advertising on podcasts. Would you like you know, to do a couple of advertising and me being this like, sort of like Xennial, like, like I'm not quite Gen X and I'm not quite a millennial, but I do come of that era where Same it's here. very, it's where it's very important that we don't like sell out where yes. we don't like, where we don't compromise like our creative vision yes. d- by getting paid for it. <laughs> like this, this Try weird, to get cable news show. <laughs> this, this, well, it's, it's weird, man. Like why? We, we all got, we all got stamped with this. And yeah, like at the totally. end of the day, like, isn't it good to just like, they didn't say like, oh, and by the way, we're going to like, we have script approval. They just said yeah. like, we're going to give you money uh, and just recommend our product, um, which, you know, okay, I will do that. And so I started doing that and that, that made about half the bills sort of like my contribution to the family. Cause it was, it was me and my now wife, you know, she was my girlfriend and then my fiance and my wife. Um, and then so, I, but I was still keeping the the day job at the fish counter because I was still, I was worried about how precarious, you know, just like completely relying on these random checks that would show up in the mail for me doing this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and you, I didn't, you didn't have kids yet at this point. I imagine. No, I, no, I did yeah. not have kids yet. What I did do was. And Portland's, I, Portland's a relatively, you can, I mean, you can live. Is, is a relatively low cost city. I mean, it, man, not, I mean, geez, not anymore. But not anymore, when I, yeah, w- yeah, when I, we moved, we moved out of there in 2009 and we moved to Austin. Yeah. Um, like, like right after, um, like the great recession, my, my wife graduated with a degree in graphic design right into the great recession. And so we, we were amongst those, we were like Okies, like we put all of our stuff in the back of a U-Haul and moved to Austin because that's where jobs were at the time for her. So I kept the job, but when when I did Revolutions, then we moved again from Austin. Uh, when we moved to Madison for the first time, I said, "When look, when I when we do this move, you know, the history of Rome was over by then. I have this idea to start Revolutions. I th- I think it's going to work. I would like the opportunity to try to do this full time. And and so the, like the deal, really, just thinking about it strategically with my wife was like, okay, let's give it one year. If you can sort of have the income yeah. that we need to have you have in a year." then let's just go ahead and go for it. Now, at this point, I do have a one-year-old son. So this, th- that's that much fir- scarier. That first year I had, I had uh twitchy, which was the twitch in my left eye, which I couldn't quite shake for about six or seven months because I was so nervous about everything. And, and I was stressed, but then like, it just, 
it just, it worked out for me. So Revolutions is awesome. Where, where did the idea for Revolutions come from? So ironically, it comes from a place where having just finished the history of Rome, which was 189 episodes where I covered a thousand year span of history, I was like, okay, the next thing I want to do, I don't want it to be uh, ancient history because I would like to not be typecast as just an ancient historian. I think that I have more in my tool belt than just ancient history. But I also wanted to do something where where the project wasn't so gigantic. And so I was just going to do these discrete seasons and have, you know, do 12, 15 episodes on the English Revolution, the the American Revolution, 15 episodes on the French Revolution. And I, and I have the notes that I was making back in 2012 and 2013 when I was first sketching this out. And it was supposed to be done in three and a half years and be a very concise thing. Ah, and then see. I could move on to something bigger. So it was those three, English, American, French. Yeah. And I, like, I knew I was going to do Haiti and I knew I was going to do Russia and I knew I was going to do Mexico at that point. Like those, those were the ones that I like knew I was going to get to. And then of course, by the time I got to the French revolution, I was in so much like constricted pain about trying to cram this stuff into 15 episodes that I just, I took the governor off and uh, just let the French revolution fly for as long as it wanted to. And it turned out to be 55 episodes long. And then I was like, well, I don't know when this is ever going to end. And so it'll probably be like a decade. It's certainly longer than the history of Rome ever was. I don't know how many episodes I've done. I've learned so much from it because there's stuff like the French Revolution, which I studied and kind of knew. And mm -hmm. but and then there's stuff like, honestly, I didn't really know anything about the Mexican Revolution. I knew sure. very little about the Haitian Revolution. So those have been great for me because I'm coming to the material really with not that much. And what I found and really enjoyed about it is that I've been able to enjoy seasons, or I don't know if they're called seasons, but revolutions that I knew a fair amount about and those I knew nothing about and, and have enjoyed them both. That's nice to hear. I mean, because there is, there I go into a lot of detail and I do try to move through these things very methodically. So yeah, even, even if you've read five, six books about the French Revolution, I think that probably there's something to be gained from listening to my 55 episode treatment of it. Because there's, there's probably stuff that's hiding in there that just gets kind of skipped over or compressed. And I try to move, like I'm trying to treat 1790 with the same degree of detail that I treat 1793. It didn't work. So much happens in 1793 that that took like 15 episodes to get through. So you're now a professional podcaster, which what a, what a world, but that's great. They told me when I was a kid, <laughs> hey, it's possible the profession that you have when you grow up doesn't even exist yet. Because we're all sitting there writing That's like, great. we, we want to so be astronauts yes, and, right. and, you know, like whatever. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And now, now I'm a professional podcaster, like whatever that is. And so you, you work in the French Revolution. You do, There is an American Revolution season, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think I haven't uh, listened to that one. I got to go back and listen to that one. That's fine. So where do you start to get the idea for this book? The idea for the Lafayette book, or at least my interest in Lafayette, comes as I'm making the transition from the American Revolution to the French Revolution. Because I'm writing the American Revolution series, knowing that the next thing I'm going to do is the French Revolution. And so I'm paying extra attention to figures who showed up in both revolutions. The two most important of them being Tom Paine and the Marquis de Lafayette. So I'm paying attention to them. And in the American revolution context, Lafayette is portrayed in a very positive way. He's George Washington's surrogate son. He paid for his own way. He helped win all these battles. Uh, he's a great guy. And then you go over and start reading books about the French Revolution. And we're talking about the same guy just a couple years later. And all these historians of the French Revolution are like, oh, here comes the bumbler Lafayette. Here comes Lafayette, who was asleep at the switch again. Here's Lafayette, who failed miserably at this, that, and the other thing. Like I, The first book I read about the French Revolution was The Oxford History of the French Revolution by William Doyle. And that guy, he does not miss a chance to take a pot shot at Lafayette. If you go through the index and start turning to every time Lafayette shows up, there's going to be some kind of little dig at him in there somewhere. So this suddenly became very interesting to me because it's the same person, more or less trying to do the same things. And in one context, historians view him very positively. In another, they view him very negatively. And so now he becomes like an interesting figure. Go through the French Revolution. I'm moving forward to like the Haitian Revolution. I find Lafayette showing up in correspondence with the presidents of Free Haiti. I'm reading a biography of Simone Bolivar as I'm writing my episodes about Spanish-American independence. And lo and behold, I find, you know, multiple pages of Bolivar being in extensive correspondence with Lafayette. And then I get to the French Revolution of 1830. 
And, you know, Lafayette's now in his 50s and 60s. He's involved in underground conspiracies to overthrow Louis XVIII, which is really the uh, one of the reasons he comes back on this famous tour to America, which is the next kind of thing that most Americans know him for. One of the reasons he goes on this tour is because he had recently been involved in some very seditious operations against Louis the 18th and they didn't work. And he was like, I don't know, I might have to go cool. Get it. out of town. I, I, yeah, I might have to go cool my heels in America for a little bit where people like me. And then he comes back and he's he's absolutely a major player in the revolution of 1830. I think he's probably the reason why Louis Philippe ultimately emerges victorious from that revolution. So now he's now he's like a 70 year old man trying to squeeze back into his old National Guard uniform. And I look back and I'm like, Lafayette has been around in more seasons of revolutions. He's appeared in more episodes and revolutions than really any other figure. And this is right at the moment when they're asking me, OK, your first book did pretty well. What would you like your second book to be? And I just say, like, I, th I think I should go back to the beginning of Lafayette's life and tell this dude's story through this 50 year, incredibly tumultuous, incredibly important period in Atlantic history and European history and world history. And then, of course, when I slid the book proposal across the table there, everybody was like, oh, the guy from Hamilton. Great. You know, here's yeah. <laughs> v. Diggs. I love that yeah, guy. Man, he yeah, rapped, course, he yeah. rapped so fast. He was the he was the best guy uh, in the whole in the whole thing. And so and then they said I could write the book. That's funny. So that I was going to ask if that was in the ether when you. So it was. I think it was probably helpful because like oh, literally when I think of Lafayette, I think of Davy Diggs, who's just the actor that plays Lafayette in the first act and Jefferson in the second. And it's just like a psychotically talented individual yeah, yeah, yeah. and incredibly the, charming. So it's like, I have a mental image when you say Marquis de Lafayette. It's like, I literally think of David Diggs. Yeah. My, and my, like going through this, I didn't do it because of Hamilton. Like I had, I had this notion in my head that I wanted to do this. And then Hamilton landed and I was like, I, I went from telling people, I'm thinking about writing a book about Lafayette and having them say, who was, was he in World War II? Um, okay. No. To either people still saying, I don't know who that person is, but good luck. Or people lighting up and saying, yeah. oh, the guy from Hamilton, amazing, do it. It's crazy too, once you realize it, how much stuff there is named after him in the States. You pass it all the time, Lafayette mm -hmm. Park is the park across sure. the White House. There's a Broadway Lafayette stop on the F train that I pass every night. Like, There's lots of people that participate in the revolution. Why are 10,000 different things <laughs> named after <laughs> this yeah. guy? It, 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 it honestly, it does trace back to this tour that he goes on in 1824 and 1825. He joined the revolution as a 19-year-old kid, right? And he was commissioned as a major general as a 19-year-old kid. So he's this very high-ranking continental officer at a very young age. And what that means is that when you get to the sort of the 50th anniversary of American independence and you get to this mm. place where, you know, when it's 1824 and 1825, there are people who are 30 years old, 40 years old. They've got kids. They've got houses. They've got a whole career. They were born after the revolution. Like that generation of founding fathers had more or less died off by this point. You know, Jefferson and Adams were still hanging around as like, I don't know, they were like 110 and like Adams had to be fed by his family. You're gonna like this. That's where he was. But point being that Lafayette was still young enough that he could go on this tour as a represent. He was the last representative of the Continental Army. He was the last surviving major general of the Continental Army. And so as he goes around every city he comes to, they're like, we we're so glad you're here. We love you. You remind us of the great revolution. We know how much you sacrificed for us. We're going to name this park after you. We're going to name this county after you. We're going to name this city after you. We're going to name this school after you. And so it's really just like everywhere he goes, they name something after him. And he visits literally all 30 states on this tour, which uh, one of the unique things about Lafayette is that even though he's this French nobleman, he's this French guy, he saw and visited more of the United States than really anybody of that generation. Because even George Washington, you know, eventually, you know, goes on a tour of the South and he goes on a tour of the North during his presidency. But you, you don't find these guys out in St. Louis or, you know, out in like right. rural Illinois or down in New Orleans or up in like upstate New York. Lafayette visited all these places. He saw America in its biggest cities. He saw America in the wilderness. He saw America in small towns. He saw America on the coast. He saw America in the hinterlands. He saw west, east, north, south. Like the guy visited everywhere. And he was an international celebrity. So when he shows up in St. Louis, which at this point is like, you know, a nothing burger out there in the middle of nowhere, it's a big deal that he shows up. So of course they're going to name things after him. So let's start with why this very young 
French nobleman Mm -hmm. decides to essentially purchase his own boat, sail across the Atlantic, and join a fight for a country he doesn't live in. I want to talk about that right after we take this quick break. All right, so Lafayette is from a very, very prominent family, right? In in France, he's a he's a nobleman. Yes. Why does he leave when he does to go across the ocean to, to find his fortune in the U.S.? Well, in the, in the colonies. There's a very specific set of events that takes him from his cushy life in Versailles over the Atlantic to joining the Continental Army. And it really comes down to the, so he he was born a noble, but on the periphery of the nobility, right? He's a provincial noble. He's not from Paris. He's not from Versailles. But because of a series of deaths in his family, he winds up inheriting an enormous amount of money from multiple noble families. And that brings him up to Paris where he's now an extremely eligible bachelor because he's this young orphan who is incredibly rich. This is like, he's like a Jane Austen character at this point. Like everybody is circling around this guy like, oh my Lord, he's an orphan and he's rich. We have to marry our daughters (laughs) to him. And so who comes calling? The Noailles family. The Noailles family are essentially the second most important family in France, second only to the Bourbons themselves, the royal family. The Noailles are right there at the inner circle of power. And they have a daughter, Adrienne. They would like to marry to Lafayette. They arrange a marriage to him. Now Lafayette enters this rarefied air of of Versailles. And he's literally in a social circle with Marie Antoinette, with the future King Louis XVI. You know, like he, that's the group that he's running around in, but he doesn't really fit in with them. And he, he's not comfortable with them. He doesn't really get along with his father-in-law who all kind of treat him as, as an awkward bumpkin from sort of outside of their mm. circle who is now trafficking with them. He thinks he's going to have a career in the French military. This is his plan. But as a result of French defeats in the Seven Years' War, which is just a couple years earlier, there's a reform movement inside of the French government and inside the French military to start getting rid of these well-connected teenagers who are being given commissions well above well above their experience and well above their talent simply because they're highly connected. And Lafayette has recently gotten a commission in the French army because he is incredibly well-connected to this incredibly well-connected family, and they kick him off the rolls. So now he's sitting there as an 18-year-old saying to himself, like, I don't fit in at Versailles. They don't like me and I don't like them. I don't get along with my father-in-law. I've just been kicked out of the army. I really, what am I going to do? I think he felt like his whole life was flashing before his eyes and he wasn't going to be able to do anything with his life. And at that same moment, there is this thing that is happening on the other side of the Atlantic, which is these colonial farmers have risen up against the British Empire and are trying to break away from them. And he's looking over there and he's saying to himself, you know, there's an opportunity for me to go over there and make my mark on the world and do something glorious, escape from this family life that I'm not particularly happy about. And then also he, like everybody else, he had been reading enlightenment literature. He, these ideas of liberty and equality and independence and national self-determination are all swirling around in his head. And it just combines to just have him make this decision. You know what? In defiance of the king, in defiance of my father-in-law, in defiance of society, I am going to, yes, buy my own boat and sail over there and join the Continental Army. And it's fairly quickly that he becomes close to Washington and becomes a very significant figure in the Continental Army. Yeah. He is seen as an enormously valuable political piece in terms of what the Second Continental Congress, what the American leaders, and what the Continental Army are trying to do. Everybody in America knows that the way that they're actually going to be able to defeat the British is if they can get the French on their sides, right? And getting all these Anglo-Protestant farmers trying to bait these absolutist Catholic Frenchmen into joining the cause is not an easy sell. But also, you know, like, we both want to my enemy yeah yeah man we both want to stick it to the british so yeah, like right, if right. we if we both want to stick it to the british let's do it and when the when the marquis de la like the us arming the mujahideen against the soviets well ba- well spencer ackerman has a theory that osama bin laden is basically the lafayette of um yes yes it's a great theory that he loves to needle me with so when he shows up he is this marquis which they'd they'd never seen a French marquee before. He's incredibly rich. He says, I'm not here for a salary. I can pay my own way. I'm I'm not here to just like make a buck off you guys. He is personally friends with Louis XVI. He's personally friends 
frenemies with Marie Antoinette, right? They weren't really friends. They were right. frenemies, but well connected. And they're like, my God, like this guy is a direct conduit back to the center of French power. And then the people in France, like the foreign minister Vergen are looking at Lafayette and saying like, man, this guy might be our conduit to the inner circle of the American leadership. George Washington. So the Second Continental Congress and George Washington, for political reasons, say, we need to bring this guy in close. We need to make him very happy. We need to give him what he wants. And in so doing, he can have a little adventure. He can run around. He can get shot at. He can go home. He can show his war wounds off to uh, the women in Versailles and then convince the French to give us a bunch of money, which that was what the plan was. And it just so happened that Lafayette himself was an endearing enough person and well-liked enough just as an individual. He was not imperious. He was not arrogant. Him and George Washington, after, after just a few weeks, really, I mean, hit it off. This comes across in the book, that he's a really likable dude, and that, at least on the colony side, and there's an intense affection, camaraderie, like he is taken into this circle because of who he is, mm -hmm. and what his name is, and his connections, but then mm -hmm. people really, like, really love this dude. Yes, I think so. And as I said in the book, his foot in the door is that he's friends with the king and queen. The reason he stays in the tent is because he does all these little things. He speaks English as much as he can. It, it's not all the time. He's just learning how to speak English. But most French officers who came over just assumed that anybody who was educated would be able to speak fluent French. And when they came over and started barking, uh, you know, trying to negotiate with the Second Continental Congress in French and everybody's staring at him like, oh, we don't speak French. We hate the French or we used to hate the French. Now we love you. So Lafayette does all of these little things when it's his turn, you know, to do like kind of the daily grunt work of being a major general. They were all on rotation, right? Like it was, you know, one guy was like the senior officer of the day and, and Lafayette did his duty diligently. The very first battle that he's in, which is, I think, when Washington goes from, oh, okay, this this guy might be kind of a nuisance. He's this absolutely untested, inexperienced, 19-year-old, rich teenager who I am tolerating for political reasons. At the Battle of Brandywine, Lafayette runs towards the battle, not away from the battle. He gets wounded. He keeps fighting. When he is ordered to retreat along with everybody else, he takes it upon himself to rally uh, a, a quite a chaotic retreat at this one particular bridge and get these guys under control and have those soldiers hold the bridge so that everybody else could get away. And this is where Washington finds him wounded and holding a bridge so that everybody can get away. Like uh, Washington is looking at this like, oh, OK, you might actually be something that I care about. And I think from that point on, that kind of ebullient courage, you know, for lack of I don't know how else to put it, really endears you to your comrades in arms in a major way. How long is he in the U.S.? He's in the U.S. Like he comes over in 1777 and he's serving in the Continental Army until Yorktown, which is in 1781. And he takes one year off. He goes back to France because this was the plan all along was to have him, you know, serve in the Continental Army and then go back to France. And Lafayette is instrumental, along with Benjamin Franklin, in convincing the French to send the expedition under Rochambeau. And then Lafayette comes back uh, around the time that Rochambeau does and rejoins the army. And he's there at Yorktown. He's fighting. He was actually the general who was in charge of the force that was trying to pin Cornwallis down before Washington and Rochambeau could get down there. And then he makes a return trip in 1784, but he's in and out of the United States for like five years, right, before he kind of goes back for good. And by the end of it, he is, Washington views him as an adopted son. Yeah. What is that relationship like? I think it is that it's very difficult to tell, especially from Washington's side, like what were they really thinking here? I do think that there is something to the notion that Lafayette was an orphan. His father was killed in battle when he was two years old. That's when he becomes the Marquis de Lafayette at the tender age of two. And then his mother died when he was like 12. And so when Lafayette shows up in Washington's camp, Washington says to him, because Lafayette is this important, valuable political piece, like I would like you to join my family. And what Washington means by this is Washington has a military family. This is kind of how Washington refers to the, the senior officers around him. And he's inviting Lafayette into that military family. But just because there's a bit of a language barrier, Lafayette hears this and he's like, my God, you know, Washington has invited me into adopted his family. Me. I'm, yeah, he's adopted me. This is fantastic. I love this guy. And so, so from Lafayette's side, 
I do think he sees in, in Washington a surrogate father. He had tried to have a bit of a surrogate father in his father-in-law, the Duke de Noailles, and that did not work. They did not get along with each other. There's a sitcom to be written about their relationship. But with Washington, you do start to get it. And now on Washington's side, though, like Washington was childless too. He was probably impotent. He was very paternal and fatherly to his adopted children. But in the main, he was very reserved in public. He had Alexander Hamilton is right there too, who's also essentially an orphan, who's very, very close to him. Washington did not develop any kind of fatherly feelings for Alexander Hamilton. That was always a very professional relationship that those two had. Whereas Lafayette comes in and there's just kind of something about him. There's something about his character. There's something about the way that he acts and talks and behaves that really melts a bit of Washington's very infamous stoic reserve. There's stories about Washington where like, you know, one officer, I forget, I forget exactly who it is that does this, but they dare another guy to go like slap Washington on the back and be like, hey, how's it going, general? And when the guy does this, he accepts the dare. Like Washington gives him this like death stare, which is do do not touch me in public. Whereas with Lafayette, as the months and then years go by, like if Lafayette wants to approach Washington and give him a kiss on each cheek, that's something Lafayette can get away with that nobody else can get away with. And so there, there is a special bond between these two guys. So Lafayette goes back to France. He has been a hero of the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. He is still a very wealthy member of the no- nobility and elite. And in the inner circle of the Ancien Regime, like th- the system that has been constructed that is about to fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he went to the United States filled with some vague, idealistic, enlightened notions that liberty is better than tyranny. All people are created equal as opposed to the old divisions of aristocracy and commons probably are not founded on anything worth salvaging. I think Lafayette comes to this conclusion very quickly, both from his own encounters with the people who hang out at Versailles. He was not very impressed with them or their talents. And then when he comes over to America, he meets these people like Hamilton or like Henry Knox or Benedict Arnold, who are really self-made people. They they came from nowhere and are suddenly leading an independence movement. So Lafayette joins in the 1780s, a fairly robust reform movement inside of the nobility and inside of sort of the upper, what we call the upper bourgeoisie, these educated French people who understood that the system that they were living under, the political system, the economic system, the social system that they were living under was really just grinding to a halt. The French monarchy more or less goes bankrupt in 1786, partly as a result of Lafayette and Benjamin Franklin convincing them to give like a billion dollars to the Americans, which then the Americans uh, mostly didn't pay back because, you know, hey, national interest. But Lafayette is heavily involved in this reform movement. He is by his nature, and I think that this is true of really his whole life, as much as he's associated with being a revolutionary and he is willing to go into revolution when necessary, he's mostly a liberal social reformer. When he sees injustice, he wants to correct it. And he spends his time, his money, his attention on poor relief, on rights for Protestants, on rights for Jews from 1783, like very, very early He's one of the earliest proponents of mass emancipation, not mass. He wants to do gradual emancipation, but he wants to abolish slavery and believes that the revolution will not be complete until slavery has been abolished. The so American he's, a, he, yeah, 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 the American yeah, so revolution. Yeah, he is an early abolitionist for a white noble person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, and there were a couple of them, you know, like he's reading the Marquis de Condorcet, who was an abolitionist. And there was a little circle in the educated elite who did recognize that slavery was a bad thing and needed to be abolished. And Lafayette joins this group. And so this puts him in the wedge that is now aiming at Ancien Regime France. And they run into an intransigent nobility who do not want to give up their privileges, who do not want to give up their special rights. And the conflict between those two and the contradiction between this sort of reactionary resistance and this liberal reform movement ultimately does explode into the French Revolution as a result of, you know, many other things. And I know we don't, we're not yes. going to be here all day. If <laughs> 55 I have to explain. episodes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But but I don't know. A vo- there was a volcano and there was a hailstorm <laughs> and, the, you know, bread prices were skyrocketing. And the next thing you know, it's the French Revolution. Well, what role does he play and when does he make his choice about which side to be on? From very early, he is elected as a delegate to the Estates General. 
So if you're familiar with the basics of the French Revolution, you know that it kind of gets going when the Estates General convene in May of 1789. By the way, the Estates General, just a little tangent, the Estates General is my favorite example of like when people talk about the Electoral College or gerrymandering that like you can contrive systems that are putatively democratic but aren't at all, right? Right. (laughs) Estates General is like, what, it's the three estates, it's the nobility, the clergy, and then like basically the entire- The commons. The commons, right? right? Mm -hmm. And like- yeah, like if the nobility and the clergy vote for something, <laughs> that, that that wins. Yeah, right? because each each estate got one vote. Yes, in this system that doesn't make a lot of it doesn't right. make a lot of sense. But it's like and- putatively. It's like the the point about the estates general to me is that the rules of whatever your putatively democratic system are matter a tremendous amount for their democratic legitimacy. And in this sense, it was like, well, you know, each estate gets a vote. <laughs> yep. And that's the way we've always done it. And I mean, that was, that was, and that's where the breakdown happens is that when, you know, the States General hadn't met, I think the last time was like 1614. It had, it had been 175 odd years since this body had convened. And when they got together, ob- the third estate who represents 95% of the population are saying like, we, we want to have at least half the votes. That's all they were asking for. Honestly, was like half the votes. They didn't even want all, they didn't want 95% of the vote. They want half. And the nobility and the clergy were trying to resist it, or at least some of them were trying to resist it to the point where that political breakdown creates the conditions that lead into the summer of 1789. So Lafayette is there for this. And he made a pledge to the people who elected him as as a as a noble delegate that I will not mess with the one estate, one vote rule unless the king says we're going to do away with it. And it's one of the very like subtle political mistakes Lafayette makes in his life. But when we advance to the fall of the Bastille. Right when the Parisians do rise up for a variety of reasons and take down the Bastille on July fourteenth, seventeen eighty nine, and this sort of in both both then and I think now in the historical memory truly marks the beginning of the French Revolution. The very next day, on July fifteenth, seventeen eighty nine, the city leaders of Paris are starting to organize a militia like a citizen militia that will be able to maintain order in the city now that we have like kicked out the king's guards. And now that we've kicked out the royal intendant, we are going to organize ourselves as a self-governing commune. We are now going to have a mayor for the first time. We're going to have this little electoral council and we need somebody to lead the militia, which is like this, it kind of doubles as a police force and a military body. And in their mind, the leaders of Paris, there's only one person who can lead this because you need somebody who has popular support, who's not going to be seen by the people as, as a tyrant or as somebody who is coming in to just like really restore order with like the iron fist, but also has something resembling military experience, somebody who can actually do the job of leading armed troops in battle or armed troops uh, through the streets of Paris. And the only person they can think of is the Marquis de Lafayette. So on July 15th, 1789, day after the Bastille falls, they acclaim him unanimously commander general of the National Guard. And then that becomes his role in the French Revolution. He is charged with keeping the peace in Paris, keeping order in Paris, while also defending revolutionary liberty at the same time, which he then does through 17. He That's what he's going to do for the next three years. And when the revolution ultimately when the women go off to Versailles in October 1789 and bring the king and queen back, now Lafayette, as the defender of order in Paris, is now also protecting the king and queen and and also protecting the people from the king and queen. And it's like an incredibly dicey place for any person to be. It's arguably one of the hardest historical jobs I've ever seen given to somebody, which is like, keep order in revolutionary Paris while also not betraying the principles of liberty and equality. Good luck. Right. He, he he did pretty well, I think, considering how difficult of a job that would be for like literally anybody. And ultimately, you know, he stumbles and falls and gets kicked out of the revolution. You moved to Paris to do this, right? I did. How was that? It was great. And then also very hard, like simultaneously. How's your French? Uh, Oh, c'est très bien, très bien. No, it's a, no, it's a très mal, très mal. My French is my French is much better than it used to be. I lived in Paris for a very weird time because I did the year of COVID in Paris. We were on a twenty three hour a day lockdown for eight weeks in I guess it was like March and April of twenty twenty. And I was over there with my wife and I had two small kids and we were in a five hundred square foot apartment. Ooh. Um so yeah, it was um, you know, it was 
It was weird and a lot. There is a whole section in the book where Lafayette is in solitary confinement in these rooms after he gets evicted from the French Revolution. He winds up in Austrian dungeons. And some of that became, I think, a little autobiographical <laughs> as I was as I was writing it. I was certainly able to feel what it might be like to be confined for a very long period of time. So your whole family was there. Yeah. Did your family like it? I mean, Paris is a, you know, one of the greatest places on earth. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, and like I say, it was, uh, you know, my kids just went to regular French school. So they both became bilingual. We were living in the Marais. We were living not too far from the Hotel de Ville. So we did it. It it was also, you know, we came back ultimately, like, and we were like, like, are we going to stay here forever? Like, are we just going to like sort of emigrate to France permanently? And I think after COVID, we both felt we were disconnected from our families, Family, which yeah. it was hard. It was hard. And, and I know that everybody was disconnected from their families. You know, I had a friend in Georgia who was disconnected from his family in, in Oregon. And I know that that's true. But we also had sovereign borders dividing us. We had an ocean dividing us. And for a lot of 2020, with it just ravaging out of control in the United States, when it looked like North America was going to become this plague continent that the rest of the world was going to have to quarantine for God knows how long. And we're just like, Jesus, are we like us moving to France was never supposed to be like, oh, by the way, you never see your family again. Right. So when things did loosen up enough and when the book got finished, we were like, okay, let's let's get to a point where we're at least driving distance from our families just on the off chance. I mean, mean, off chance, like things like this will happen again. Like this is COVID is not the COVID is the first of many, not the last of anything, unfortunately. Yeah, I fear that's true. As someone who has lived abroad, just come back, went through COVID there and written a book about someone who moved between two different worlds in moments of revolutionary fervor. I mean, one of the things that I've taken from the revolution series is the famous Lenin quote, which I'm going to mangle about like decades where nothing happens and Mm -hmm. weeks where decades happen. And Mm -hmm. it's interesting because you'll see that in the podcast in terms of how time gets like condensed or distended because there will be a week in the French revolution or 10 days in 1917 that are epochal. And then there's longer periods of time where very little happens compared to those kind of intense 10 times. It's hard to have historical perspective on your own time, but it does feel to me now that there's a lot (laughs) happening here. And I just wonder, like, your perspective as someone who thinks about this full time. Yeah, we're we're having a moment here. (laughs) Just so you know, I like you, you know, I came out of the 90s, which feels like one of those decades where nothing happened which I know is my own perspective on things, but I just felt like I drank a lot of Starbucks and watched Seinfeld. And like, that's really all that happened in the 1990s. So no, we're having a lot going on here because I was still in France when when January 6th happened and all the election, like I I watched all that sort of from afar. It was really nice to get, it's always nice to like get outside of things. So you can sort of look back and see what's happening. It is sometimes hard to get perspective when you're in the middle of something and literally in the middle of something. Whereas I watched a lot of the Trump presidency kind of like one step removed. And I remember like, especially like when I was on a 23 hour day lockdown in my apartment in Paris and my Twitter is just, you know, people that I follow on Twitter and you would get these comments from, let's say conservatives or people on Fox news who are like, you know, CNN's only hyping COVID to get Trump, you know, they just, or like you, you were banging your shoe against the table from like day one. Right. And, and good job for doing that. But like people, people probably said to you, the only reason you're hyping this is because you hate Trump. This has right, nothing to do with co- hysterical and ridiculous. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. yeah. Right. Like it's no, it's no different from the flu. And I'm like sitting there like, Dude, the whole, this is happening in the whole world, right? Like I can't leave my apartment and I promise you Macron is not locking me in this apartment because he's trying to stick it to Trump. So it is nice to get that perspective. Well, it's funny you say that because we're speaking today in late September on a Wednesday. My A Block tonight is actually on this topic. The A Block is a riff about Ron DeSantis taking a shot at Australia and saying it's, he's not sure if it's even a free country anymore and China might be more free than Australia because of the severity of their COVID restrictions. And the thing that was that drove me crazy is I had friends in other countries. I'll never forget during COVID talking to a friend, a very good friend of ours who lives in Buenos Aires. And in Buenos Aires, like she was talking about how she went out for her daily walk and that like you can basically only leave the house to go get groceries and yep. you better have a grocery bag or the cops mm-hmm. are going to come and ask to see your groceries or give you a ticket. Yes. And this was a common thing. Like, and here we're in the US. It's like we're under quote unquote lockdown, which like men, 
you know, it meant that these businesses were closed. There was a public health order. It did really change the texture of daily life. But at any point, you could have walked anywhere you wanted. You could get in your car. You could have driven to see your relatives four mm-hmm. states away. No one was stopping you. Mm-hmm. There are people landing in JFK just walking through. Like, not sure. And so, and then at the same time, you have Trump and all these people saying, like, this is tyranny and liberate Michigan. And I would talk to people in other countries. They're like, dude, like, I literally cannot leave my house. I cannot go outside. <laughs> Yeah. And that was my experience. You know, I had to, I had to carry a piece of paper with me and it was not just like perfunctory. There were cops that were roaming around and I would have to talk to them. And believe me, talking to French police in your sort of like decent French that I have, they're like, what are you even doing here? You know, yeah, like, right. and I got two kids with me, like, and we could take them out. So like, usually like, look, I'm walking a kid. Like we had to walk our kids. Like we walked dogs. Man, we had to like get them out of the house just to give them some fresh air. So yeah, the perspective, the United States has always had a reputation for being incredibly parochial in its outlook. And it's just utter inability to see what is happening in the rest of the world and to only care about what's happening in the United States. And I knew this intellectually. I know it's a true thing. I've traveled abroad and it's quite noticeable, but having lived over there for three years, like it's even more noticeable. Right. What did January 6th look like as a person who studies revolutions and was watching it from abroad. Okay. So January 6th gets us back to like my first book, which is called the storm before the storm, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, which is all about how in the middle of the second century BC, there were a bunch of confluent factors uh, that contributed to a breakdown of political norms, political comity, and more aggressive politicking among the senatorial elite where they stopped believing in the Republican system as it had existed for centuries and started taking any opportunity to seize power when it was presented to them and to not really care about the way that things had been done before. This leads from a system that was pretty intact in terms of transferring power and holding elections and whoever wins the election wins the election. And as you, as I go through this book, by the time that you're a th- two thirds of the way through it, you have somebody's about to win an election And another faction doesn't want them to win that election. And so they've got the hired swordsmen who are on retainer and bring them down to the forum and have them literally kick over the voting urns, like the physical voting urns where votes are being calculated to disrupt this election and prevent the alternate and prevent the opposing candidate from winning. This is two thirds of the way through the book. By the end of the book, we are talking about entire armies are marching against each other, uh, trying to achieve the same ends. And a lot of the events at the end of this book do come down to issues of one person has won a vote and the other side's not very happy about it. And what are we going to do? Are we just going to accept it? Or am I going to march my six legions into Rome and prevent that election from taking place? So all of that was written with some degree of concern about what is happening in the United States with the American Republic and American democracy, which, and I was writing this like in 2014 and 2015 and 2016. And then of course, when Trump comes along, everybody's like, dude, you better hustle this book out the door, or it's not going to be like a prescient warning. It's going to be like, dude, that's old news. Right. Yeah, man, we, are, we already we already know how the, the American Republic falls. Like it's, it, we're, we're living through it right now. So then you get to the election of 2020 where Trump did the same thing that he did in 2016, which is say, if I lose this election, it's only because of fraud, right? It is, this will be, my loss means it was fraudulent. And so then they do this and we all lived through months of them saying it's fraudulent, trying to prove that it's fraudulent, failing to prove that it's fraudulent, but just going out there and saying it again anyway. Then basically saying, we're going to have this huge rally. We're going to point it at the, um, you know, at the peaceful transfer of power from one party to another, then they're holding the rally, then they're charging into the Capitol. And there were still lots of people who were like, wow, this is, I can't believe this is happening. This is so surprising. What do you think they've been talking? They've been telling us that they were going to do this for months. When are people going to realize that this is actually a thing people are willing to do now? It's, it's just, it's so outside of the lived experience of a couple of generations of Americans, right, who grew up in the wake of World War II and who then lived through all of the second half of the 20th century where things like this didn't happen. It's very shocking to them. And it's, it's, you know, it was shock, like, and I will admit, like, it was shocking to me to like actually watch the mob go up there and do this. The fact they got in was shocking. I mean, yeah, that yeah, was sure, what was sure. shocking was like, yeah, wait, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, which, mm-hmm, you yeah, know, why did that happen? Right. Um, 
But so watching it on TV was like, oh, wow, this is shocking that this is happening. But also like, of course, this is going to happen. And what I try to tell people and what I will tell to everybody who's listening right now is January 6th was not the end of anything, right? It was not the climax of anything. It was not the final word in anything. It was not the high watermark of anything. It was something that they did that didn't quite work right? I don't know how far they would have taken it. You know, we have now seen what the plan was. Had a couple of things gone differently, would they have taken hostages? And what would the result of that have been, right? right? Because that's yeah. that's that's what we were going for. And now that the, all of that happened, and I do feel like, uh, and I know that you're involved in, you know, what I would call sort of the media establishment because, you know, because of your job, there is a great degree of concern that I have that it, we are not really turning hard on the people who organized that yeah. and let it. People like Ted Cruz, people like Holly, they should have been expelled from the Senate. There are representatives who should have been expelled from the House of Representatives for having participated in it. And because none of those things happened, we have now set a precedent where those kinds of things can happen again. And I think that in 2022, we will see the same kinds of things happen anywhere there is a close election, especially at the state level. I live outside of Madison, Wisconsin. And, you know, if Evers squeaks out a win by a couple thousand votes, which is not outside the realm of possibility, I don't see any way of getting out of that without something similar to January 6th happening here. Yeah, that's the the fact that it's not a high watermark, the fact that it's established a kind of precedent, a model, even just like a mental mm -hmm. model for people. Mm -hmm. It's now in the realm of possibility for sure. And there's no consequences for it, is there? There is essentially none. I mean, the people are being prosecuted, although, you know. So that's soldiers, man. Like, right, what do you, right. yeah, like, yeah. great. You got Cali. Good right. work. What about Kissinger? Mike Duncan is a historian. He's author of the New York Times bestselling book, Hero of Two Worlds, The Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution. It's a biography of Marquis de Lafayette, chronicles the clashes he had with successive governments here in the U.S. and then in France until his death in 1834. He's host of the Phenomenal Revolutions podcast. The book's phenomenal, too. I mean, if you like Mike's writing as spoken in revolutions, you'll love the book. He also hosted the podcast, The History of Rome. It's such a great pleasure to get to talk to you, Mike. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, great thanks to Mike Duncan. Again, uh, the book is awesome. The podcast is awesome. You should check all of that out and send your feedback. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.